That CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... documentation to prove that a person's hair can turn white because of a terrifying experience. It has also been proven that a person can actually die of fright, although that eventuality is more likely to occur if the person already has a weak heart, as did Major John Sholto in the Sherlock Holmes classic tale, The Sign of the Four. Come closer, Thaddeus. I don't think I have much time left before I die. Bend down closer. I want to whisper to you the place where I've hidden the treasure. <laughs> Is it that it? A little more. Huh? That face! The face at the window! Don't let him in! Keep him away! <laughs> Our mystery drama, The Sign of the Four, was adapted from the Sherlock Holmes classic, especially for the Mystery Theater, by Murray Burnett, and stars Kevin McCarthy. I'll be back shortly with Act One. A famous poem goes, London is a man's town with power in the air. Paris is a lady's town with flowers in her hair. It's a lovely fancy, but London is also a town full of ghosts. The wives of Henry VIII wailing in the tower. The echoes of the voices of William Pitt, Cromwell, and Edmund Burke in the House of Parliament. And, of course, the lean figure of Sherlock Holmes in his deer stalker hat, prowling the streets in search of a criminal. Our story today starts in the famous bachelor quarters of Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson at 221B Baker Street. Miss Mary Morstan, please have a seat and tell me what brings you to me. I have come to you, Mr. Holmes, because I can hardly imagine anything more strange, more utterly inexplicable than the situation in which I find myself. Capital, capital. You hear that, Watson? Uh, State your case, if you please. Well, nearly ten years ago, on the 3rd of December, 1878, my father, who was a senior captain of a regiment, came home from India on leave and disappeared without a trace. Hmm. You notified the police? Oh, of course. When I came to his hotel, I learned that he had left the night before and had not returned. Hmm. I called the police immediately. His luggage? Remained intact at the hotel. The police were very thorough but a search produced no clue at all. Had he any friends in London? One. A retired fellow officer in the same regiment, Major John Sholto. We communicated with him, of course, but he hadn't even known my father was in England. Singular. Well, I haven't come to the most singular part. A year later, on my birthday, May 4th, I received through the post a small cardboard box, which, when I opened it, contained a single, large, lustrous pearl. Since then, every year on my birthday, I receive an identical box containing a similar pearl and no clue as to the sender. I took them to an expert who pronounced them to be both rare and valuable. But I brought them. You can see for yourself. Better and better. But surely something else has happened to bring you to me today. Just this morning, I received this letter... Perhaps you'll read it for yourself. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Be at the third pillar from left outside Lyceum Theater tonight at 7 o'clock. If you are distrustful, bring two friends. You are a wronged woman and shall have justice. Do not bring police. If you do, all will be in vain. Your unknown friend. Now, this is really a pretty little mystery. What do you intend to do, Miss Marston? That's exactly what I want to ask you. What should I do? We shall most certainly go. 
you and I and Dr. Watson. My notes show that the charming Miss Morstan, Holmes, and myself were on hand at the dot of seven and were met by a coachman who, after ascertaining that none of us was from the police, took us up in the coach and whipped up his horse. Mr. Holmes, do you have any idea where we are going? Well, I imagine to meet the man who sent you the pearls and wrote the letter. I've examined the handwriting and find there can be no question but that the same person was responsible. Responsible for both, yes. Watson, you look closely at the address in the note. What do you make of this fellow's scribble? Oh, well, it's certainly legible and regular, even though he's tried to disguise it. A man of business habits and some force of character. No, 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 my dear chap. Huh? Look at his long letters. They hardly rise above the common herd. The D might be an A and the I an E. Men of character always differentiate their long letters, however huh. illegibly they may write. There's also vacillation in his K's and self-esteem in his capitals. Uh, we'll soon see if my diagnosis is correct, because I believe we're almost at our destination. Let us descend. Uh, your, your, your servant, Miss Mostyn. Uh, your servant, gentlemen. Uh, pray step into my little sanctum. Uh, oh, please make yourselves comfortable. I am Thaddeus Sholto, and uh, you, of course, are uh, Miss Mostyn. And these gentlemen? Uh, Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Uh, a doctor. Uh, have you your stethoscope? Uh, 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 well, might I ask you to listen to my heart for a moment? I have grave doubts about my mitral valve. Uh, if you'd be so kind. <laughs> there in that strange small room with the glossy tapestries, richly mounted paintings, and two great tiger skins on the floor, I listened to the strange little man's heart and found nothing amiss except that he was in an ecstasy of fear, for he shivered from head to foot. Well, Doctor, what, what, what do you find? <clears throat> well, you've no cause for uneasiness. Appears to be normal. Oh, excuse my anxiety, Miss Mostyn, but I, I'm a great sufferer, and I've long had suspicions about that valve, and I'm delighted to hear that they're unwarranted. Had your father, Miss Mostyn, refrained from throwing a strain upon his heart, he might have been alive today. Oh, I was afraid he was dead. Perhaps, sir, you can tell me how he died. So I shall at once. Uh, my father, as you may have guessed, was Major John Sholto, a dear friend of your father, Miss Morstan. Now, 11 years ago, he retired and came to live at Pondicherry Lodge in Upper Norwood. Now, my brother and I were his sole relatives, uh, my mother having died in India. All that we knew was that our father was rich and lived both in luxury and fear. He never went out alone and employed two prize fighters as bodyguards. Well, we'd become quite accustomed to it until... until the arrival of a letter from India early in 1882. He fainted at the breakfast table, and from that day, he sickened to his death. At the end of April, we were informed that there was no hope, and he wished to make a last communication to us. Uh, I shall try to repeat his own words. At this supreme moment, I have much on my conscience. First, I lied to you, my sons, when I said I knew nothing about Morstan's death. I knew all about it. But I swear it was none of my doing. Please, Father, please don't excite yourself. No matter now. Morstan and I, through a remarkable chain of circumstances, came into possession of a fabulous treasure. I brought it to England upon my retirement. When Morstan got leave, he came straight here to claim his share. <coughs> Please, a little water. water. Father, Father, you don't have to tell us any of this. Save your strength. I must. I must right the wrong I've done Morstan's girl. You see... That night, he and I quarreled over the division of the Agra treasure. He'd always had a weak heart, which he'd concealed from people for years. He sprang out of his chair in a paroxysm of anger, fell backwards suddenly, hitting his head on the desk. And when I stooped over him, to my horror, I found he was dead. 
But why keep his death a secret? Because my own faithful servant for 20 years, Lal Chowder, wouldn't believe me. He said he'd heard us quarreling, but that I should have no fear. He'd dispose of the body. No one would be the wiser. Oh, surely, Father, that was most unwise. Why did you You're ever... a fool, Thaddeus. I told Lyle the truth, and he didn't believe me. Now, if my own faithful servant thought I'd killed Morstan, what would the police have thought? No, 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 that was right. What was wrong was in keeping Morstan's share of the treasure. And you want us to right this wrong? Yes, 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 but I must tell you where I've hidden the treasure. You will then make restitution. Put your ear down close to my mouth. My strength is... <coughs> keep him out! The face at the window! For the Lord's sake, keep him out! <coughs> my brother and I rushed to the window, but we were only in time to catch a glimpse of a wild, cruel-eyed, hairy face before it disappeared. When we returned... Our father was dead. Who's there? I, McMurdo. Surely you know my knock by this time. Would seem your brother Bartholomew also protects himself against intruders. Evening, Mr. Thaddeus. Where do be the others? I've had no orders about them. I distinctly told my brother last night I was bringing friends. Well, they ain't been out of his rooms all day, Mr. Thaddeus, and I have no orders. I can let you in, but your friends must stay where they are. If I guarantee them, that should be good enough for you. Now, you can't keep a young lady waiting out on a cold night like this. Very sorry, Mr. Thaddeus. Mr. McMurdo, I don't think you can have forgotten me. Don't you remember that amateur who fought three rounds with you in Allison's rooms? The night of the benefit, two years back. Not Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Indeed. Rule Street. Hmm. McMurdo won't keep us out in the cold now, I'm sure. In you come, sir. You and your friends. Who's the tell, Mr. Thatches? I'm glad to see you. The master ain't ate a thing all day. I brought him up a tray and knocked. He didn't keep an answer. But I, I, I don't understand any of it. Bartholomew was expecting us. I suggest we go up to your brother, Mr. Sholto. <laughs> There's something amiss with Bartholomew. My nerves can't stand Quiet, this. quiet. Let's see if we can rouse him. Open up. Open up, Mr. Sholto. It's your brother and some friends. Bolted. Watson, put your eye to the keyhole and let us know what you see. Uh, good Lord, Holmes. There's something devilish in there. What's to be done? The door must come down. Give me a hand. All right. Uh, <coughs> The scene which met our eyes was so bizarre, it might well have come straight out of the Grand Guignol. The room had been fitted up as a chemical laboratory, with glass stoppered bottles, Bunsen burners, and other scientific paraphernalia. Bartholomew Sholto sat in a wooden chair by a large table in the center of the room. One glance showed that he was dead with a ghastly, inscrutable smile on his face. Look here, Watson. What do you make of this? Well, appears to be a, a, a thorn stuck in the skin just above the ear. Precisely. You may pluck it out, but be careful, for it's poisoned. Oh, dear. And read what's scrawled upon that torn sheet of paper. The sign mm. of the four. In heaven's name, what does it mean, Holmes? Murder, Watson. Murder, vengeance... I have but to supply only two more links to have an entirely connected case. Only two more links and the puzzle will fall in place? Watson has a hundred questions, and I'm sure that you have an equal number that you'd like answered. They will be, as we follow the clues with Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson when we continue with Act Two in just a few minutes. From time immemorial, men have sought buried treasure. Few have found it, 
and many have died in the search. Fabulous riches seem to be a Pandora's box which unleashes the human passions of greed, deceit, and treachery, which ultimately lead to death. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson are examining the room in which Bartholomew Sholto met his dreadful death. Now, Watson, we have a half hour before the police come. Let us make good use of it. In the first place, how did these folks come and how did they go? Folk? You, you mean there was more than one? Well, surely. Now, let us first examine the window. Window locked on inside. No hinges. We open it. No water pipe near. Roof quite out of reach. Yet a man is mounted by the window. It rained little last night, and here is the print of a foot upon the sill. And here is a circular muddy mark. And there again on the floor by the table. You see, Watson? Uh, well, mm-hmm. that's not a footmark. Well, it's something much more valuable. The impression of a wooden stump. Oh, come, Holmes. You, you never make me believe a wooden-legged man climbed up the wall and... Uh... Come here a minute. Come here a minute. Now, look out the window. Uh. Could any able-bodied man scale that sheer brick wall? Well, absolutely impossible. Agreed. But suppose you had a friend up here who lowered you this good stout rope that I see over there in the corner. Then I think, if you were an active man, you might swarm up, wooden leg and all, and then get away in the same fashion. Your ally would then lock the window from the inside after drawing up the rope. Well, it, it, it seems possible, but how can you be so certain? Well, you notice I examined the rope from which I deduced that our wooden-legged man, though a fair climber, wasn't a professional sailor. His hands were far from horny. If you look closely, especially towards the end of the rope, you'll see that he slipped down so fast he took a good deal of skin off his hands. <sighs> All right, but uh, uh, what about this mysterious ally? How did he get in? Capital, Watson, capital. You've hit upon the singular aspect of the case, although there are parallels in India. But if you look around the house and the grounds, you'll find the solution. Well, aside from the fact that it looks as if all the moles in England have been let loose about the place, I see nothing to help us. Oh, once again, you've hit upon it, Watson. The holes, of course, were dug in the course of the search for the treasure, which was ultimately found... In the secret room above here. Between this room and the garret. Ah, of course. He came through the hole in the ceiling by way of the roof. Of course he did. And now it behooves us to extend our investigation to the secret room in which the treasure was found. Here you are, Watson. A trap door which leads out to the roof. This, then, is the way number one entered. Aha, look, on the floor... We shall find other traces of his individuality. The print of a small, naked foot. Good, good Lord, Holmes. A, a child has done this horrible thing? Oh, nonsense, Watson. Now, this was something I should have foreseen. My memory failed me momentarily. Well, there's nothing more to be learned here. Well, but, uh, Holmes, if, if it wasn't a child, what was it? Well, you know my methods, Watson. Apply them. Well, I... I, I... Go up there! Who are you and what are you doing? Constabulary, we'd best go down and explain our presence. Why, it's Mr. Sherlock Holmes, the theorist. Mr. Athelney Jones. Uh, The same, sir. Mm -hmm. Uh, But there's no room for theories here. Uh, By his own admission, Sholto was with his brother last night. Uh, The brother died of some fit or other, and Sholto walked off with the treasure. Uh, How does that strike you? On which the dead man got up and locked the door on the inside. Um, eh, but we mustn't lose sight of the facts. Now, this Thaddeus Sholto was his brother. There was an argument. The brother is dead. The jewels are gone. Well, you're not quite in possession of all the facts, Inspector. This splinter of wood, which I have every reason to believe to be poisoned, was in the man's scalp. You can see the mark. This card inscribed, as you see it, was on the table, and beside it lay this rather curious stone-headed instrument. Well, there's no difficulty there. The house is full of Indian curiosities. If the splinter's poisonous, Thaddeus could well have made use of it. Now, the only question remaining is, how did he get out? Ah, I've got it. The hole in the ceiling. It must lead to the roof. Uh, you are up there, sir. Is there a... A trapdoor, which could be opened, which leads on to the roof. Well, then I have my case. 
I'm going to charge Thaddeus Sholto. Well, I must warn you, Inspector, that you're moving too fast too soon. Well, with all due respect to your theories, Mr. Holmes, I'm satisfied that I have all I need. Well, then you would have no interest in the name and description of one of the two men who were in this room last night. I'm a police officer, Mr. Holmes. And if that's a joke, it's in very bad taste. Mm. His name is Jonathan Small. He's poorly educated, small, active. He's lost his right leg and wears a wooden stump which is worn away on the inner side. His left boot has a coarse, square-toed sole with an iron band around the heel. He's middle-aged, much sunburned, and has been a convict, and there's a good deal of skin missing from the palms of his hands. <laughs> well, it beats me how you come up with all these things, Mr. Holmes. But I admit, you make it sound mighty convincing. Uh, how about the other man? The other man, Inspector, is a rather curious person. I hope to be able to introduce you to the pair of them before you drag poor Mr. Sholto into court. Holmes sent me to see Mary Morstan safely home and meet him back at Baker Street. There was little conversation on the ride back to her lodgings in the cab. I, I accepted her offer of tea. Dr. Watson... I'm truly sorry that I seem to have dragged you into a nightmare. Oh, oh my dear girl, don't apologize. Holmes and I, uh, well, uh, we've investigated some pretty rough cases, and besides, uh, had you not come to us, uh, we should never have met. It's kind of you to say that. Uh, kindness has nothing to do with it. Mary, uh, I, I mean Miss Morrison. Oh, you may call me Mary. Uh, Mary, I, I... Yes? Well, I, I was going to say that you, you need have no fear. Holmes will get to the bottom of this. With your help. Oh, sure. Holmes is kind enough to say that I act as a sort of catalyst to him, but... I'm I... sure it's true. But you said something before about the case bringing us together. Was that important to you? Well, I should say... Well, you know that, don't you, Manny? Well, I thought so, but... Well, you seem changed. Well, you know, Holmes will surely recover the treasure. That will make you a very rich young lady. Oh, I'm not thinking about that. Well, I am. Why? Because it's important. Very. Not to me. And I shouldn't have thought that you were the type to be so concerned with money. At least you didn't appear that way when we first met. Yes. Well, the situation was a bit different then, wasn't it? How? Well, <clears throat> for one thing, I, I had no idea you'd turn out to be such a wealthy woman. And why should that matter? Well, hang it all, Mary. If, if you can't see how it matters, I can't possibly explain it to you. So, uh, well, I wish you a very good night. I left Miss Morstan's lodgings in a foul mood and went directly to our rooms at Baker Street and then to bed. I was awakened very early the next morning by the curious sound of what I was sure was a dog barking. I thought I must have dreamed it, because I knew Holmes would never have a dog in our lodgings. And then Holmes rapped on the door and called out sharply. I need you, my dear chap. Get dressed. And be sure to put on a pair of stout walking shoes. I was out of bed, washed and dressed speedily, and upon entering the study, saw that I hadn't dreamed the dog. Uh, what's this, Holmes? Well, even you, my dear chap, can see that this is a dog. His uh, name well, is Toby. He's probably the best tracker in London, and today we're going to use him to lead us to Jonathan Small. Well, with all due respect to Toby's nose, Holmes, how in the world do you expect a dog to track a scent which is at least 24 hours old? I ask you to sniff this handkerchief. Huh? Hmm? Well? Hmm. There's a distinctly tarry smell about it. Exactly. Now, in my investigations at Pondicherry Lodge last night, I ascertained that our small man had stepped onto some creosote on the edge of the window. If you can smell it, I have no doubt that Toby here will have even less difficulty in tracking. So, let's be off to Pondicherry Lodge and start our hunt. Just as the sun was rising, I found myself with Holmes on the grounds of Pondicherry Lodge. Holmes began to circle around the house, looking, as he put it, for a likely spot where our small man descended. Yeah, it would have to be someplace it's climbable. Uh-huh. Here. There's a water spout that seems pretty firm. What do you say, Watson? Well, I can't budge it, Holmes. So it should certainly have held the small man's weight. And here's a water barrel. Here, bring Toby over here, will you? And I'll let him get a whiff of this handkerchief, and then we shall see what happens. 
Here you are, Toby. Smell it. Smell it. Ah, he's on the trail, Watson. Toby led us across the grounds and over to the boundary wall, whining eagerly. He led us to a break from which we could see people had clambered over the wall. Holmes climbed up. I handed Toby up to him, joined him, and then we dropped down to the other side. Ah, we're in luck. There's been no rain. The scent's still very strong. Hope we should have no trouble. Hello. Hello, what's this? Well... Appears to be a cigarette case. You no, know, something much more deadly, I suspect. You see these hellish things, Watson? Yes. They're the same as the thorn we found in Bath Hall and Lucia. Exactly. And mind you, don't prick yourself. I'd sooner face a bullet myself. All right, old boy, all right. We're with you. Well, we're fortunate that one of those devils put his foot in Chris, old eh, Holmes? Chance has given us an easy way of tracing them, but I have enough knowledge to enable me to trace them in four different ways. This is just the simplest. <laughs> I marvel at the way you obtain your results. How, for example, could you describe the wooden-legged man to Inspector Jones with such confidence? Ah, there's no miracle there, my dear fellow. As soon as we heard of the existence of a treasure, everything became obvious. Oh. Think, Watson. Two officers assigned to India. It was child's play to ascertain from the war office that they were in command of a convict guard. <laughs> Now, you recall the piece of paper belonging to Captain Morstan that Miss Morstan showed us on the way to Pondicherry Lodge? Well, it was some old map. Yes, precisely. The sort of map used to locate a treasure, and it was signed Jonathan Small and three other non-English names. Ah, oh, the sign of the four. Excellent, Watson. Now, think back on how Major Sholto died. Well, his heart gave out. Yes, but why, man? What caused it? Well, Thaddeus told us he saw a face at the window. It frightened him. Exactly. Now, doesn't it follow that a man who deprived his own partner of a treasure would also deprive a convict of his share and would then live in fear in the event that the convict escaped? Uh, Actual fear of his life. But, but, but Holmes, you said it, it wasn't Small who killed Bartholomew, his associate. Quite so. Quite so. Did you take a pistol with you? Well, I had my stick. Well, I'll leave the wooden leg man to you. But if the associate turns nasty, I shall shoot him dead. We, we, we seem to be approaching their hiding place. Undoubtedly. Keep a sharp eye out. They seem to have taken refuge in a lumber yard. No, oh, where's the little beast taking us? Holmes! Holmes, what, what does this mean? <laughs> it means, my dear Watson, that Toby's nose is infallible. Huh? That barrel on which he jumped so proudly is a barrel full of creosote. In the famous Conan Doyle story, A Scandal in Bohemia, Sherlock Holmes was outwitted for the first time in his life by a woman, Irene Adler, who Holmes ever after referred to as the woman. Now it appears that the great detective has been misled by a dog. We'll return with Act Three in just a few minutes. The legendary pot of gold at the end of the rainbow is old stuff. And I dare say most of us have chased it at one time or another only to have the sought-after treasure turn out to be worthless. However, I doubt if any of us have had the unfortunate experience of Sherlock Holmes and his friend Dr. Watson, who, believing they'd found the hiding place of a pair of criminals and a cache of fabulous jewels, found instead only a barrel of creosote. It's obvious what happened, Watson. If you remember the place where our good friend Toby seemed to lose the trail... That must have been where two trails crossed. Toby just chose the wrong one. We're fortunate that it's not too far back. Come, let's retrace our steps. And so it proved. Taken back to where he'd been running in circles, Toby happily set off on another trail which led us through Belmont Place and Princes Street right down to the water's edge where there was a small wooden wharf. Toby led us to the very edge where he stood whining, looking out on the dark current beyond. We've run out of luck, Watson. They've taken to a boat, yeah? Uh, well, 
That's that, then, huh? Mm. They've gotten clean away. Not necessarily. Look at that sign. Uh, Mordecai Smith. Boats for hire by the hour of the day, including the steam launch Aurora. And we see from the pile of coke on the jetty that the Aurora is indeed a steam launch and that she isn't here. Come, Watson. Just keep Toby quiet while I see if anyone's in the shack. Yes? I'd like to speak to Mordecai Smith. Oh, I'm sorry to say, sir, my man's away. I've been away since yesterday morning, Uh. sir. And truth to tell, I'm beginning to feel frightened about him. I wanted to hire his steam launch. Oh, I bless you, sir. It's in the steam launch that he's gone. And that's what puzzles me, for I know there ain't enough coals in earth that would take her to Woolwich and back. Well, mightn't he have bought some of the wharf down the river? Oh, it weren't his way, sir. Besides, I didn't like that wooden-legged man with his ugly face in outlandish talk. You say a wooden-legged man? Oh, yes, sir. A brown, monkey-faced chap. It was him that roused my man yesterday night. And what's more... There was steam up in the launch. Oh, I'll tell you straight, sir. I'm half sick with worry. I'm sorry, Mrs. Smith, because I wanted a steam launch. And I've heard good reports of the Aurora. She's green with a yellow line and very broad in the beam. Oh, then it can't be the Aurora you're after, sir. Ah. She's as trim a little thing as any on the river. And she's been fresh painted black with two red streaks. <laughs> I was all for engaging a launch and setting off downriver to track the Aurora when Holmes pointed out what a colossal task that would be. Therefore, after returning Toby to his grateful owner, we found ourselves in the office of Atherney Jones at Scotland Yard. Oh, Storms, Mm -hmm. I'm very happy to tell you I've got the whole lot of them in jail now. The whole lot? Yes, the brother Thaddeus, that prize fighter McMurdo, and the Indian servant Lal something or other. And there's no question, but they were in it together. How did you arrive at that interesting conclusion? Well, you helped by showing me that there had to be two people. And what more likely than those two who were always in the house? Well, haven't you overlooked the fact that they were loyal servants of the murdered man? Oh, according to Thaddeus, Mr. Holmes. He wanted to lead us up the garden path, you see. And the motive? The missing treasure, of course. The murdered man was, by all accounts... A tight-fisted skin flint who didn't want to give up his share of the treasure to his partner. And he must have been the same way with his servants. The treasure is the key, Mr. Holmes. Mark my words. I agree with you. But I gave you the name of the man I believe responsible. Mm. And you're sticking to that? Well, we shall see, Mr. Holmes. We shall see. Uh, what brought you here, then? I'm here to ask a favor. I'd like a missing steam launch located. It's the sort of job you people here at Scotland Yard do so well. (laughs) A steam launch? Don't tell me one of your clients mislaid his launch. I won't. I believe it's connected with the Sholto killing. How? I think the criminals used it to effect their escape. All that day and the morning of the next... Holmes fretted, complaining about the fact that Scotland Yard had been unable to locate the Aurora. The whole river has been searched on either side with no success. It's too much. If there's no word today, I'll be forced to believe they've scuttled the craft. But there aren't too many logical objections to that. I put an advertisement in the agony column of the Times, and if we hear nothing today, I'll have to take to the river myself. Well, I, I shall accompany you. No, no, no. You'd be much more useful if you stay here as my representative. Well, but, but, but home. No need to argue, for it may not come to that. We may yet have news today. But we heard nothing. On the following day, Holmes left before I was up. I lounged around the flat all day, hoping there was no flaw in my companion's reasoning. And at three o'clock, there was a knock on the door. Good day, sir. Mr. Holmes is out, I understand. Uh, yes, yes, Inspector. I, I don't know when he'll be back. But if you'd care to wait, take a chair and, and uh, try one of these cigars. Uh, thank you. I don't mind if I do. Your friend, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, is a wonderful man, sir. I had this wire from him this morning. Here's the message. <laughs> Go to Baker Street at once. If I have not returned, wait for me. I'm close on the track. You can come with us tonight if you want to be in at the finish. 
What do you make of it? Well, sounds hopeful. Are you expecting someone? Oh, well, uh, perhaps an answer to Holmes' advertisement. Excuse me. Uh, yes, my man? Oh. What is it? Well, now, sir, uh, you must give an old cod like me uh, time to catch his breath after these stairs. Oh, yes? Is Mr. Sherlock Holmes here? Uh, no, but uh, come in, come in. Uh, I'm acting for him. You can give me the message. Nay, nay, it was only to himself I was to tell it. Uh, but I tell you, I'm his representative. Mm -hmm. You, was it about the Aurora, mm -hmm. Mordecai Smith's boat? Mm -hmm. I know where it is, and I knows where the men she's after are, and I knows where the treasure is. I knows all about it. Well, then tell me. Mm -hmm. I, I shall let him know. It was to him I was to tell it. I'm a police officer. You have important information, and we shall keep you, whether you like it or not, until our friend returns. Mm, pretty sort of treatment, this. I come here to see a gentleman, and you two seize me and treat me in this fashion. Oh, now, now, now. I, I, I promise you, you shan't lose a penny for your loss of time. Mm -hmm. uh, just sit over there on the sofa, and you, you won't have to wait long. Mm -hmm. All right. We'll see. We'll see. Huh. Well, now, Inspector, where were we? As I was just about to say that I think Mr. Sherlock Holmes would have made a most promising police officer. Oh, here, yeah, your cigar's gone out. <laughs> Allow me to relight it. Huh? Well, I think that you might offer me a cigar, too. Oh, Holmes! Where's the old man? Here he is. Wig, whiskers, eyebrows, and all. Good Lord. I hardly expected my disguise to stand a test like this. Oh, you are a rogue, sir. <laughs> the case is all but solved. You may have all the official credit, but I insist on certain conditions. Agreed? Uh, entirely, if we're successful. We shall be. First, I want your fastest police boat, a steam launch at the Westminster Stairs at 7 o'clock tonight. Easily managed. Mm -hmm. We shall need two staunch men in case of resistance. You shall have them. And when we capture the man, we'll get the treasure. Here's our launch, Mr. Holmes, right on the dot. Mm -hmm. Oh, have that green light taken off the side. We don't want to have it spotted as a police launch. Uh, see to it, men. Come aboard, gentlemen. Where to, Mr. Holmes? To the tower. Stop opposite Jacobson's yard. Mm -hmm. Well, for heaven's sake, Holmes... Are you going to tell us how you located the Aurora? Deduction, Watson. Pure deduction. I knew that if Scotland Yard reported she hadn't put it at any wharf or slip along the river, she hadn't. Therefore, where would one hide a steam launch but didn't have enough coal to go very far? Mm -hmm. Well, I might very well hand the launch over to some boat builder to make some trifling repair. She would then be removed to his yard and effectively concealed. Well, that seems a very simple solution. And it's always the simple things which are overlooked. I drew 14 blanks until I learned that the Aurora had been handed over to Jacobson's yard for a repair to her rudder. A needless one, I might add. And that she would be called for at 8 o'clock sharp tonight. But, but where are they going? Either to Gravesend or the Downs. To board some ship that will take them out of the country. Well, you've worked it out all very neatly. But if the affair were in my hands, I'd have some policemen in Jacobson's and nab them when they came down. Which would be never. This man's small as a shrewd article. He'd undoubtedly send someone ahead to make sure that there was no one lurking around the yard. <sighs> well, and now we wait, huh? Exactly. And the minute we sight her, we go after her. <laughs> After eight holes. And there's the Aurora. And going like the very devil. Get after her. The launch with the yellow light. By heaven, she's a flyer. Uh -huh. I think we're gaining. Oh, I'm sure of it. Oh, we'll be up with her in, in a very few minutes. And Holmes, that is a child on the deck. You should have consulted the encyclopedia, my dear Watson, about the aborigines of the Andaman Islands, who are reported to be the smallest race on Earth, as well as the fiercest and most intractable. We're near enough to hail them. Ahoy, Aurora! Down, man! This is the police! Down for your life! You hit him, Holmes! Yes. That little savage won't blow any more of his poison darts. I thought we'd found all of them in the pouch. All except the one he carried in his blowpipe. They've turned. They're heading for shore. But they'll run aground. Stand clear. 
swing about and mind her stern. The Aurora had run aground on a mud bank. The wooden-legged man, mouthing curses, sprang ashore, but his stump sank in the mud. He was easily captured. The treasure chest was intact on the deck of the Aurora, and in a very short time, I brought it to Mary Morstan. The chest wasn't heavy, but my heart was. You weren't hurt? Oh, Dr. Watson, I'm glad to see you're all right. Oh, it <laughs> came through with flying colors, uh, and here's your treasure. Well, aren't you going to open it? It's strange, but the treasure seems to mean more to you than it does to me. Well, I'd rather say that it means a lot to both of us. Um, you need some help with the lid there. I... Thank you. What? Why, it's empty. What? It can't be. It's impossible. Oh, would you see who that is, please? Oh, yes, yes, certainly. Oh, Holmes. Do you know that the treasure is gone? Yes. Well, do you know where it is? At the bottom of the Thames. We're small through the gems, piece by piece, during the chase. Oh, dear. Wouldn't it have been simpler for him just to chuck the chest overboard? Well, that was a compliment to me. He told us that any man smart enough to track him would be smart enough to fish up a whole chest from the bottom of the river. Well, that, that means that Mary will never get... To... Well, I think she'll get something she treasures a lot more, Watson. If you will ask her to be your wife... <laughs> And so Doyle married Watson off to Mary Morstan, and they lived happily ever after. But Doyle didn't. He found that having Watson, a married man, interfered with his being able to accompany Holmes on his cases. He regretted ever having created the character. But being a true English gentleman, he never killed Mary off, but was forever sending her on vacations to allow Watson to move back with Holmes. I'll be back shortly. One of the most intriguing elements of the Sherlock Holmes stories was the fabulously provocative titles of cases that Holmes had worked on, but which Watson never chronicled. Years later, Doyle's son and John Dixon Carr collaborated on writing some to fit the titles. But the most tantalizing title of all has never been attempted. That title is The Adventure of Ricoletti of the Clubfoot and His Abominable Wife. Now, there's a title that conjures up all sorts of deviltry. Maybe one of our mystery theater writers will come up with a story to fit it. Our cast included Kevin McCarthy, Court Benson, Jackson Beck, Earl Hammond, and Joan Shea. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. <laughs>